So after watching my last video, you are tempted to join that guild or brotherhood. Well, in this video, I'm going to tell you how you can join and how you can progress up the ranks to eventually becoming leader of your guild. My name's Inwills and welcome to the In Crowd. I always forget to wink. There's always a pause before I wink. Hello and welcome back to this second video all about brotherhoods, cults, guilds, orders. In the last video I gave you an overview of these and in this video we're going to get down to the nitty gritty. How can you actually become a member and how do you progress up the ranks? Now if you missed the last video then I think it'll be the card will be up there somewhere so do go and have a look at it but don't worry if you haven't then this video stands perfectly by itself. So in order to join a order, I think I'm just going to call them orders for the rest of this video rather than saying order, cult, brotherhood, guild. Yeah, let's just stick with order. So in order to join an order, you can actually do this in two places. Initially, it can be part of character generation. So you suggest things to your GM and the they, you work together, you co-create membership and if this is the way that you're going to join the order then you will become um, an initiate or you are part of the order right from day one. Now if you would like to join an order throughout the game then there's you're required to do a number of things and the first thing that you are required to do is to demonstrate that you are worthy to join the order. Second, you have to impress the order's leaders in order to gain membership. And third, yes, you have to make some kind of donation. Now, this is where you can really sort of like develop your character within the adventures or the campaign and you should work alongside your GM now to sort of like create um, answers to the, the following questions. So first things first, you have to demonstrate your worthiness. Now this could be done on a variety of ways. For example, it, you could be asked to perform a quest or to go off and find somebody or you might have to engage in some of the new social conflict rules that have just come out in the Mithras Companion, you know, and sort of like over a period of time um, demonstrate and plead your case. It could be that it is as quite as simple as giving a speech about your worthiness and how the deeds in your past or the character's past actually allows you to be a worthy member of the order. Um, the second thing that you have to do is impress the examiners, impress the leaders of the order. And you can do this again in a variety of ways and please consult with your GM about this. But basically it could be anything from rolling a specific skill. For example, if you are um, joining a, a merchant order, then you might be asked to use your commerce skill to value certain items to see whether or not you can see the real value of them, which of course is important to all merchants. It could be um, just using a passion or the passion might actually allow you to demonstrate how um, keen and worthy you are to follow the order's rulings. And finally, the donations. Yes, it is suggested that all characters provide some form of donation to the order's leaders or the order itself in order to demonstrate their worthiness and again something to discuss with your GM this could be monetary value coinage or value um, it might be if your campaign is not particularly rich in money and coinage it might be that you have to sort of like sign over all your worldly goods 
or or say that when you die everything that you have and own will go to the order so have a chat with your gm about it and try to come up with some interesting ideas now once you have membership then your next role within the order is to progress up the ranks now in the previous video i mentioned these ranks um, as they are common dedicated proven overseer and leader and i also mentioned that if you go to the core rule book on page 197 at the top there's a table that provides other titles for different um orders for example if you are in a sorcery order then instead of being called common dedicated proven overseer or leader then your titles would be novice apprentice adept mage and then arch mage but again these can be altered for your campaign and now in the core rule book what it does using the generic titles is that it provides a brief description it also allows you to see what your duties would be and also your privileges and it also talks about requirements and it's these requirements that i'm going to look at next to see how the rule set actually supports your progression through the order and how those experience roles that i mentioned in a previous video um adds to your progression through your the ranks of your order so the requirements for the common rank the base level rank is that you must have some basic understanding of the beliefs of the organization and you make your donation and you demonstrate your worthiness as i previously talked about now in order to progress to the second rank the dedicated rank and remember that's just the generic term then you have to have knowledge and abilities um, in order to progress to that rank and how this uh, manifests itself in the rule set is that you must have at least five of the order skills to 50 percent or more now this immediately sort of like demonstrates that each order has a range of skills that they actually train in or they're based on so for example if it was some kind of thieving guild or order then skills such as stealth um, might be an important skill that would be one of the five if it's a merchant then it, they might have things like bargaining and commerce um, even locale and things like that that you have to progress up so so the next rank is proven and as you go up the ranks there are less and less people that actually hold these ranks now in order to, the requirements to be a proven rank is that you must be a dedicated member of the order and you have to be actually within the order for a minimum of three years and you must know at least four of the order skills to 70% or better okay so there's a time element and a skill element also um, a valuable gift or service must be rendered to the order in order to demonstrate devotion or loyalty so you can see that the um, the criteria to prove and progress in ranks is becoming more and more involved and you can hopefully see how um, game content campaign money actions and skill progressions have started to link together now as we progress even higher the next rank is the overseer and they have very specific duties they might be um, in in charge of local um, temples or shrines or guild houses and they they're probably um, been a member of the cult or order for some significant time in fact it they have to have a minimum of five years service to the order in order to reach the rank of overseer so it's not something that you can just sort of like wake up one morning and suddenly decide you want to be one as well as this you have to have at least three of the order skills at 90 percent or higher and 
I really like this aspect of the um, rule set in Mithras because now we are moving up to the priest and soon to the high priest and these are not people who are first level characters although you could create those in your campaign but they've had a minimum of five years in the order they are real sort of like ambassadors for that order and their characters probably developed um, in line with the order's philosophies, which I think is really an interesting decision. Um, there is this element of um, five years or three years and how you actually build that into your campaign. And for me as a GM at the moment, my thought is to probably have a bit of a gap in the ODES campaign when we give the players the options to change their characters if they wish. But what I'm going to be saying is that, right, five years have gone by or three years have gone by. So if, for example, people wanted to carry on playing the same character, then they can actually have progressed in their, um, in their order and come back either as a priest or a high priest or mage and archmage. And finally, the pinnacle of the order, is the leader, the, the high priest, the archmage, the chief merchant. These are the people who are actually in charge of not only a small area or a small district, but the whole order itself. Now, in order to be a leader, you have to be a minimum of 10 years at least in the order. And it has to be mentioned at this point that even if you meet the minimum requirements, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will automatically become a leader. And throughout the ranks, there is the option for the social conflict rules to be engaged with, but also this element of um, political intrigue or, you know, certain people in the ranks deciding to use rather drastic actions to eliminate the competition. Now, as well as 10 years, you have to have at least two of the order skills at a level of 110% or more. You know, so it really is a huge investment of time and energy. Um, they have to have performed an invaluable service for the order and have to be um, have that worthy recognition as a future guide or leader or custodian of the order. And that sort of like sums it up, the membership of orders and the progression. Now, in order to provide you with some information about this or some how we actually play this in the ODES campaign that I run with my players, I managed to grab uh, Mr. Pickles, who actually plays the thesis Bartleby Fumus in our campaign. And I asked him some questions about his the order he is he belongs to and his idea about gifts and progression. So here he is. So Bartleby is um, a member of the Order of Amriel. And one of the things that we can have in orders are gifts. Now, we haven't actually um, played any of these or thought about it at all, but um, for people who want to check them up, they're on page 202 of the core rule book. And well, you know, when you know you get to priest level and you get your first gift, is there something in that list that you think that will be really good for um, Bartleby or the order? Is it something that you sort of like look down and think, yeah, definitely that one? What's your thoughts about it? Well, I, this is the first time I think that I've really looked at this. I might have seen it in a while past, but the one that kind of stands out to me um, is Oracle. Because you've had my goddess Amriel give me kind of strange visions and, and yeah. fractured truths and, and abstract thoughts. Which and I did like. It be interesting. <laughs> I really do <laughs> delight in those. <laughs> I, I always sit there and feel a little puzzled and go, Amriel, what are you trying to teach me here? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think it could be interesting if I if Barleby got a more clarified ability to, to view a few things and be able to tell people with uh, reasonable accuracy, as it states, the, the likely fate of 
I think that would be really then? interesting. I wrote a poem once. I've only written one poem in all my life. That was actually called the the mysterious the mysterious oracle of night, and it was based those the initial letters of mysterious oracle of night actually says moon, and it was about the moon. <laughs> and I think that was sort of like connects there quite quite nicely. So yeah, I can I can imagine priests of Amriel being able to do some kind of fortune telling or looking to the future. I think they would make them highly desirable in um yes. in the campaign do you want to i've just had another because there's an opposite to you isn't there there's amriel who's the the moon and then there's i think it's mar margroth or i don't even know my own uh, maroth maroth and i was just yeah. thinking that that would you know you might have amriel um priests of amriel sort of like protecting the good but if there was an evil person who wanted to have that oracle, then priests of Maroth might be able to actually provide that opportunity. <laughs> That's given me a lot of ideas. So what about restrictions? You know, because there's, there's meant to be restrictions in orders and we haven't got any at the moment because both you and Gulliver are quite low level. You know what? What about as Bartleby sort of like progresses up? Um, what sort of like restrictions do you think he should encounter? That's, that's a very good question. I, I think we've toyed around the idea that there might be a restriction on romantic intent yeah. for, for priests, uh, but I, I haven't heard anything set in stone on that. Um, I think it could be cool to make, um, make, make some more what's the word for it um uh, vows of of abstinence yeah. um like like having to refuse intoxicating beverage or or something something of that sort um it's it's difficult because it's a moon goddess and i'm not exactly sure what the moon goddess would frown on um I, selfishness you, you, is kind of what comes yes. to my mind I, you're just hoping that I don't say that you're not allowed to go out under the sun because <laughs> you can only I go out become a vampire <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I think I how I see it as a GM is that as the um, as the campaign progresses because you're playing Bartleby Bartleby will probably impose his own restrictions and that will become part <laughs> of the because i i'm a great believer that i don't like to set everything out in stone right at the beginning because number one i can't think that far ahead and number two i don't want to impose all my restrictions on people i want almost like that co-creation to happen and i think as bartleby is progressing maybe you know it might just become one day that you sort of like say to briar you know i'm sorry priest of amriel cannot you know and then that would be that that would be that restriction in place so as you get higher level if Bartleby ever gets to higher level and it becomes <laughs> a priest of Amriel or a high priest you have the ability to call down divine intervention and this is when you call on the power of your god you're not casting a miracle at all you are just calling i i assume in times of great desperation you just call down the power of your god or goddess and something happens what well, what's your feelings about that as bartleby oh, i definitely like the rule that it reduces your devotion down um because otherwise uh, why wouldn't you be calling your goddess as as much as possible to save the day a barbarian yes. comes running at you may as well call your goddess yeah um but i think i think that that kind of comes back to the trust that has to happen when there's a divine based character in a campaign uh, i mean i need to trust that you're not going to abuse me with my goddess and you need to mm. trust that i'm not going to abuse the gifts from my goddess otherwise exactly. that would be yeah. nonsense um and so i think that I think divine in intervention for this case would would work, but that'd be something that I'd be 
calling up for grand and great monsters, dragons. Uh, yeah, that are attacking. Or um, I, I, it was almost like, and I know you didn't have to, but in that in the tavern when the barbarian comes up to you you know there i i see situations for divine intervention is not when you are taking harm as in bartleby or you're going to get harmed it's more sort of like a lot bigger than that you know yeah if, you know if there's a group of innocents uh, you know there about to be breathed on by a a dragon and you're there you know, it's I I almost like imagine Bartleby saying, "I'm real. Please protect them." You know, rather than yeah. "Please protect us." You know, I might be yeah. wrong there. You might be thinking, <laughs> you know, and go, almost like being prepared to take the the negatives in order to protect yeah. others. Is that how you see? Yeah, it, that's Bartleby? what I was gonna say. Oh, definitely, yeah. it'd be it'd be a uh, take me instead. Yeah, I uh, also think to, to save them. Yeah, I also think it gives. Uh, I, when I was looking at divine intervention, I almost like wanted to make a burnt out priest. You know that call down so much intervention to save a populace of people, that suddenly his devotion is completely gone, and he's almost like lost huh. all faith you know in the the divine being and you know especially if he he or she was once a, a thesis of amriel and i go not that, that sounds like a <laughs> uh, it sounds like something that would be a movie is yeah. young priest and old priest <laughs> or, or maybe just my campaign we will wait and see <laughs> As always, if you have enjoyed this video, then please consider liking, commenting, or subscribing. Not only does it support my channel, but also supports my dream. And don't forget, if you are interested in listening to the Mithras Matters podcast that I produce with help from a variety of content creators and um, people heavily involved with the Mithras rule set, then please do look down below at, at the link and have a listen and subscribe to that as well. It comes out at the on the first of every month. So until next time, I hope that all your opposed roles give you a well-earned special. And until next time, Happy Mithrasing. See you all later, friends. Bye.